We have some breaking news. Applause broke out at the U.N. this morning after the U.N. Security Council voted 14 to 0 to pass a ceasefire resolution. Unlike the previous resolutions, the U.S. chose to abstain rather than veto it this time. This resolution calls for an immediate ceasefire during Ramadan and the release of all hostages. Now, Russians attempted to include the word permanent into the language, but the U.S. shot that down and instead got it to be replaced with uh, replacing permanent with the word lasting. Now, importantly, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield remarked that the U.S. did not agree with everything in the resolution, hence the abstention, and stressed that the resolution is non-binding. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some disturbing news out of Khan Yunus over the weekend in Gaza as the Israeli army reportedly besieged two hospitals in southern Gaza. The Red Crescent Society reported heavy gunfire and shelling at Al Amal Hospital and Nasser Hospital. Let's take a look at some of the footage on the ground from Al Jazeera. You will call that Nasser Hospital was the site where infants were found decomposing in an ICU ward after the forced evacuation by Israeli troops last December. The Intercept's Jamie Scahill interviewed a Canadian doctor who recently returned from a 10-day medical mi mission in Gaza. About and it was interviewed about the conditions at Nasser Hospital. He described those conditions as a quote death zone. Now this follows leaked drone footage from Friday, which shows what appeared to be four unarmed Palestinians being killed by Israeli air attacks while walking, also in Khan Yunus. A U.N. deputy spokesperson commented on the footage, saying that, quote, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez is deeply disturbed by the video footage and that he's calling for a, quote, thorough, independent, incredible investigation into the apparent killing of Gazan civilians. Before they were killed, the four youths were looking through rubble that used to be their homes. From the footage, it's clear that the civilians were not armed, nor were they taking a threatening posture. Mm. So there's a lot going on there. Right up top, importantly, this breaking news about there being finally some kind of a ceasefire resolution that survives a U.S. veto. Now, in advance of this, uh, while the vote was pending, Netanyahu basically uh, said that he would cancel his visit to Washington if the United States did not do as it had in the past and intervene on behalf of Israel and veto the ceasefire vote. For whatever reason, it seems that our government has been shifted on this and it did not interfe intervene. It did not interfere. And as we said up top, there was applause, very unusually, that rung out in the uh, UN General, um, uh, the, the, the Security Council after this vote managed to pass. Yeah, I find it interesting that what is the difference between a permanent peace and a lasting peace? Um, but it's, okay. Well, it's a big uh, difference, and I think that's, a, that's an important point. What you know, pro ceasefire activists, lasting the United is more States, more aspirational than permanent. I mean, lasting could last a day. That's a big difference from being permanent. So the concern is that if you have a complete release of hostages, which this um, resolution calls for, uh, then there is absolutely no leverage remaining to prevent a siege of Gaza, the collective punishment, the blocking of aid, and all the other things that are resulting in this incredibly high death toll in Gaza. Ostensibly, the fact of the hostages existing certainly hasn't been stopping um, Israel from enacting the siege as it's been doing for the last five months or so. But the only leverage that potentially still exists, apart from the international community, is ostensibly the existence of these hostages. So I think it's important to note that this does represent some movement on the behalf of the U.S. government's posture, but still is not a capitulation to the goals of the ceasefire movement, as it were, because it is a permanent ceasefire movement. My point, I just looked it up, and Merriam-Webster says lasting, durable, stable are all synonyms for permanent. My, my point being, like, I don't, it didn't seem worth the fight over changing the word. It means essentially the same thing as well. Well, that, and that's an argument for asking why the United States objected right, to it saying. being. Right, that's what I was That was okay, the, so that, the thrust so it, of my comment. So it evinces, you're agreeing that it evinces an American and perhaps by proxy Israeli intent not to create a permanent ceasefire. Sure. Right. And that, and that is exactly what the tension is between the statements that Biden has been making over the last couple of weeks or so, adopting the ceasefire language without pushing for a permanent ceasefire. As always, ever since he started using the ceasefire language, activists have pointed out that he, they want a permanent ceasefire and that he's been talking specifically about a six-week ceasefire. And a ceasefire lasting for the duration of Ramadan is very much just saying, 
what he's always been saying before. Of course, this is non-binding. This is just an aspirational right. declaration for what the countries who voted this way want to happen in the region. It's not accompanied by any kind of enforcement mechanism. So that's what Linda Thomas-Greenfield, our ambassador, said as she was giving her remarks after the vote. And we will be talking, hopefully, with Trita Parsi tomorrow, unpacking exactly what this means for Israel going forward. But it's worth noting this is coming on the heels of a pretty tough media cycle for Israel over the weekend. On Friday, this drone footage that was released from an Israeli drone showing four young uh, Palestinian individuals walking along, picking through rubble, unarmed, minding their business and seeing them kind of summarily executed in that way on video was the kind of footage that really set the country aflame when we saw the famous Julian Assange Black Hawk footage. And we're seeing this all right again on the heels of a funding package being passed that sends another $3.8 billion of aid to Israel. What does that mean for the voting public as they see that there's a complete and total lack of accountability for what is happening in Israel to Palestine, or in Gaza, rather, by Israelis right. to Palestinians um, and, and funded by and enabled by their own government, not just in terms of financing it, but also in terms of providing a certain amount of protection um, on an international stage through these UN vetoes. Yeah, I, I did watch that um, drone footage. It is, um, it is horrible. There's an initial explosion that kills, I think, three of them, and then another who gets away briefly and then is droned additionally to death. Um, there's no one else around. It is not in a conflict or there's no active conflict going on. Um, I would like to hear what the possible potential explanation anyone at the IDF could give for why that took place so we can judge that. But um, I, I did see, I, I saw that footage prompting um, a lot of skeptical commentary from, uh, from, from various people kind of along the lines of enough is enough. Um, this has clearly gone over some precipice. Yeah, I mean, you're getting, it's not, it's no longer a left reaction, a left activist movement. Yeah. Um, uh, Katie Halber just pointed out that Norman Orenstein uh, of the American Enterprise Inter Institute, no left wing um, biases there, is uh, saying that the West Bank settlement attacks are a bridge too far. It's time to, for Biden to distance himself from Netanyahu. That this is kind of a middle finger. He uses different language in Norm, Norm, Norman's tweet, but it's a kind of a, an, an F you to Joe Biden. At a certain point, uh, you can't keep running cover for someone who's going to thumb his nose at you in that way. Read you another great quote. Uh, Israel has lost the high ground. This is not war. It is robotic mass genocide. That's Alex Jones giving his take. Yeah, I did see that. I mean, and this is part, we talked about this in a different segment with AOC. This is part of why I think she's not getting as much credit as you might expect coming out using the word genocide, being very critical of Israel's behavior in this moment now, because we are so far into this crisis. And if you're at a, at a point where you're standing alongside um, Chuck Schumer, folks from the American Enterprise Institute and Alex Jones, are you really taking a brave and radical position? Where were you months ago when some of your colleagues like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar were sticking their necks out and getting censured by Congress as a consequence. Mm -hmm. She didn't participate in those uh, censorship votes, obviously. But her, I think her, her current vocal posture would have been appreciated back then. Hmm. Well, we will continue to monitor the situation. We'll be back, excuse me, we'll be back with more Rising right after this.